Mm. Hello everyone watching from TV land, internet land as it is now I suppose. <laughs> Bible studies right now, that's when it starts. <laughs> Two. One of them is me. You're watching yourself? I can read comments that way. Oh, okay. They don't stay up very long on that. I imagine the second one is Ashley. No, it's Aunt Teresa. So it's Ashley's aunt, aunt. She lives in Nebraska. I think both pronunciations are correct, depending on what side of the country you're from. Yeah, I don't know. I always feel like ants are little bugs. Um, back in New York, it's ants, and here it's on. Auntie. 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 Hello, Aunt Teresa. Oh, my father in law's watching. Hello, Roy. <laughs> <coughs> We're a couple minutes behind today. That's okay. My fault. I had to fire the cameraman. Get a new one. Why? Half his salary. <laughs> Oh. Your wife's got me delivering all the salt cutter now. All over. She, I started out with one dinner, and she's like, well, we might have this one, and they're thinking if Marianne and Kevin don't come, I would deliver a meal to them. And it's like, I'm on call with you. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get started then. Um, now I got the notification the church is live. <coughs> we are on page 45 in the workbooks if you're following along at home. Page 45, chapter 10. Um, we're going to be talking about race and racism today. CRT. That, was, that was last week. We'll talk more about it. It'll, it keeps coming up again and again and again. Um, but specifically today we're going to talk about classical racism versus the new racism and how the definition of racism has changed. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, this is the, the piece of being accused racist without ever having been racist. And we'll talk about why that is and where that comes from and how do we respond and all that. Um, but before we get to that, while we're still waiting for folks to turn on the internet, um, we'll just do a brief review of what we talked about previously. Um, so last week we spent some time talking about um, liberation theology. Uh, liberation theology, it's been around for a long time. Um, and it teaches Christianity um, via Marxism. Um, the understanding is, is that Christianity's purpose is to break down oppressive systems. Um, and so if Christianity is not breaking down oppressive systems, then Christianity isn't true. Um, in liberation theology, it doesn't have anything really to do with Jesus or God or salvation or sin or forgiveness. Um, it's all just a tool about um, a tool about bringing down these these oppressive systems, um, and then establishing a an earthly kingdom of, of well, a utopia, as we've been talking about talking about for a while here. Um, yeah, and so one of the main modern modern proponents of it, uh, teachers of it, is a guy named Ibram Kennedy. Uh, Kendi, um, and, and he's, he teach, his, his words are, Jesus was a revolutionary, and so we have to start a revolution. Um, again, following those, those Marxist lines. Um, Jesus was not about a kingdom on this world. Um, he very specifically told Pontius Pilate that, my kingdom's not of this world. Um, and we continue to follow in his footsteps in that. And then after that, we moved on. We talked about um, your oppression score, and we talked about intersectionality. 
and how the more oppressed groups you're part of, the higher your score is, and the higher your score is, the greater value your opinion has, or weight, moral authority you have um, on an opinion. Um, and so we think back to that issue uh, with Ben Shapiro, uh, where he was asked how could he have an opinion on a moral issue because he was uh, a white, well-off man. Right? So how could he have an opinion on an issue, um, specifically the issue of, of abortion? Um, because he has such, such a low intersectionality or oppression score. Whereas somebody who is all the opposites of things, a, a, a person of color um, and poor and a, a woman um, or anything like that would have greater moral authority, not because of what they believe, just because of their which particular groups they are assigned to. Um, and I, as a white, middle class, man, clergy, heterosexual, educated, uh, I'm sure there's more. I think I have a negative score when it comes to oppression. <laughs> um, but that's, that's how that works out. Um, yeah, so today then, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about racism, and so we're going to have more, start off with more of a Bible study um, in the sense of looking at passages of the Bible very specifically about race, uh, and then we're going to move on and we're going to talk about um, what anti-racism is and how anti-racism anti -racism has become the new racism. Um, yeah. And as always, I have the, the Facebook chat open if you have things to type. I know it's a challenge, but we'll do, make, do the best that we can as we go through. Um, yeah, watching, watching myself online. Um, yeah, uh, then, okay, so we only have a couple weeks left. We'll only have two more weeks of class after this. Um, and so the next week we'll talk um, Specifically, I was wrong with my weeks last week. Uh, next week we'll talk about um, Black Lives Matter leadership. Um, we'll take a look at that, that structure as a whole. And then <coughs> we'll start to talk about, excuse me, um, the, uh, the clash between the old definition of racism and the new definition of racism. Um, that'll be next week. And then the following week, we'll spend the whole time talking about what do we do about all of these things? Um, and that'll be a lot of fun as we go through it. Okay, let's, let's dive in. So on page 45, here we go. So, discussing race today is difficult due to the raw emotions that come with it. There are many minorities who have experienced undeniable racism and they bear deep personal scars from their encounters. But there are also people who resent being called a racist because they despise racism and have never participated in a racist act. This and the following chapters of this study will focus on the cultural Marxist influence on race relations. The reality is that there are two different definitions of racism being used today, which is confusing and frustrating for a lot of people. Each definition of racism requires a different solution from individuals and from society. One definition of racism is consistent with the Bible, the other is not. It comes out of cultural Marxism critical race theory, and it will be addressed in chapter 11, which we'll get to later on tonight. So racism is an issue, and it must be addressed. But before we can address it, we have to understand it. This section of the study will cover it at length, beginning with an examination of traditional definition of racism, the one that's consistent with scripture. Yeah, formerly, uh, back in the days of yore, I guess, uh, Merriam-Webster defined racism as, quote, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Do you think that this is an accurate definition of racism? Why do you answer that way? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the definition is, uh, racism is defined as a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities 
and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. That's the, uh, the old definition. Okay? How would you define racism then? Flag on the play. Huh? Flag on the play. Hello. Good to see you too. Well, I can't see you, but hello anyway. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so we'll go through these, these various Bible passages um, and then we'll talk about them. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 verse 27 says this, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created of them. Uh, since God created Adam and Eve, and they are the parents of all of us, what does that say about the origin of race in general? How does that speak to racism? In my mind, we're all the same race. Yep, there's one race, the human race. Exactly right. Um, so how does this speak to racism? Racism is a sinful division um, that has been brought in, uh, where we are, uh, our sin has trained us to look at each other um, with disdain and makes it easy for us to commit other acts of sin against one another. Um, to dehumanize each other, I would say. Um, and so we can see that racism um, is not part of God's original plan for creation, but it is a result um, of fallen human nature, and it's also a result of believing lies of the devil, that there are more than one race. Okay, uh, next passage, 1 Samuel 16. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. A man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks in the heart. So 1 Samuel 16, 7 reminds us that, that we should not get infatuated with the outward qualities, outward qualities of people, such as beauty or strength or skin color. According to this verse, what does God care about? Is Martin Luther put it best, the content of your character, your heart. Yeah, your heart. God, God wants us to care about uh, on the inside. Um, thus, what should we care about? The same the things, right? Um, that we look past what people look at um, and, and get to the, <laughs> the heart of the matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure who Puns. said it, but I... Um, the quote, don't judge a book by its cover. Yes, we've been around for a long time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and another uh, a takeaway from this that, that we use in the church um, is we can't see salvation. Right? I don't know. I can't, I can't see what's in your heart to see, to see if you're saved. Um, so all that I can do is tell you about Jesus. I can confront sin when I see it. I can call people to repentance. I can proclaim God's law. Um, but then all I can do is, is tell and talk about Christ. Um, yeah. Hello, thanks for being here. All right, next one. I'm Jeremiah chapter one. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I appointed you to the prophet of all, to be a prophet to the nation. So this verse teaches us that God is the creator of all life, and as such, each life belongs to God, and each life has a purpose. The value and purpose of a life is not determined by race. Um, in, in fancy Lutheran words, because I firmly believe if you want to sound smart, you say it in Latin, right? Talk about it all the time. Uh, the words vocation, not vacation with an A, vocation with an O. You can hear the word vocal in it. Um, calling. This is, this, is, this is your calling. Again, you want to sound smart, you say it, man. Uh, but God has given each of us a purpose. He's given each of us a calling. Uh, and that calling isn't based on anything except God's desire for us to, to live, in, live in his world and to serve one another. 
the next one. John chapter 10, verse 3, and verses 14 through 15. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Then Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus knows every person by name. He will even leave the 99 sheep to find the one that is lost, because each individual is precious to him. It is very important for us to see people as individuals, rather than identifying them solely according to their group identity. Um, judging people by their group identity um, is completely unfair, and it's a key aspect of racism. Which one? What's what? What? Uh, what the judging just, people? What you just read. <sighs> um. Probably the Eighth Commandment. That would be the commandment I would say that breaks. Uh, and so the Eighth Commandment is to, to uphold a neighbor's reputation, would, would be how we'd say it. Uh, I, like to, to, I like to talk about it as always trying to put the best construction on things. Mm -hmm. Giving people the benefit of the doubt is probably the more modern, modern way to say it. And so by just looking at someone and making a snap judgment or assuming something about them based on their appearance isn't doing justice to that commandment um, to how God wants us to act. I mean, it doesn't have to be, it is, it's not just based on race, uh, that's what the topic of today is, but any kind of snap judgment um, isn't giving that person the benefit of the doubt. Um, because now you're no longer interacting with the person, you're inter interacting with the idea of that person. Um, so if somebody gets in and scored differently, they won't. Yeah, um, that, that, that's an excellent example. Um, or somebody wearing shabby clothes or somebody wearing super nice clothes. Like it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. We have to be careful to, to not let our assumptions and our biases, our own sinful nature, hinder us um, from seeing that person as someone that Jesus died for. Um, the next one, famous words from John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God is our creator, but he is also our Savior and Redeemer um, in his Son, Jesus Christ. If Jesus loves each person and died on the cross to forgive the sins of each person, so that each person who believes in him would be with him for all eternity, what does this teach us of how we are to value and treat an individual? We've talked about it. That person is someone that Jesus wanted to die for. So we see each person is created, redeemed, and dearly loved by God. How can with this verse impact our attitude and behavior towards others? I think a great way that this, this verse impacts us is it's, it's the great equalizer. Um, there's that famous passage. Let me get the book wrong. I'm just not going to say the book because I'm going to get it wrong. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, man nor woman, um, for we all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Jesus is, is the great equalizer. All of us have, have equal access to God through Christ. Uh, none of us is more worthy or more holy or, or more better. Or, um, we're all equal um, before Christ. Um, even, even our enemies, even those people that want and seek to do us harm, um, that person is someone that Jesus died for. And those sins are sins that Jesus died on the cross to pay for. Um, and so no matter who it is, uh, we always treat them as somebody that Jesus, you know, as it says here, as someone that Jesus created, redeemed, and loves. Um, and that that takes away our ability to behave behave otherwise. Somebody else is here? Amy! <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. <laughs> So this verse teaches us that people from all nations, from tribes, from peoples and languages, cultures and races, um, are all in heaven right now. Uh, 
Uh, God does not select us based on our outward qualities. Uh, we are his by grace through faith in his son. So at this very moment, there are people who are sitting in God's presence um, before the throne of, of God Almighty, worshiping in his, in his heavenly temple from literally all over the world. Um, every, every language, languages that don't even exist anymore that we don't understand. Um, from every culture, um, every continent, everywhere. Uh, because God does not discriminate based on outward quality. Um, what unites us is the grace that we have in Christ, the faith that we have in him, and salvation that Jesus has won for us. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. So in light of Jesus' words, ask yourself this question. Do you want to be judged and treated a certain way according to the color of your skin? If not, should we do that to others? No. no. So after reading through scripture, we can clearly see that racism is an assault on God's creation. It's an assault on God's creation and his loving work of redemption in Jesus. Every person is precious to God and likewise should be precious to us. Every person. Racism is utterly sinful and it results in great evil. So, a few questions for, for pondering here. Um, that's, that's, it actually says that. Let's take some time to ponder. That's a good word. To ponder and discuss what racism can do to a person and to a community. So what can racism do to a person's conscience and sense of identity? And there's two ways to look at this. There's a way to look at it as being the person who's racist, and the way to look at the, pre the person who has been discriminated against because they're race, because of their skin color. Um, so what can racism do to a person's conscience and sense of, ident sense of identity? The racist person um, is just instilled hatred mm -hmm. um, to the person that's being discriminated. It's, it instills, you know, a sense of inferiority. Yeah. Or could or could be hatred too. Hatred too. Yep. There's some certainly. If somebody was discriminated against me based upon my race, I would feel angry about that as well. That could that definitely lead to hatred. Yeah. I, I you know, I hear news stories about, you know, CRT being caught in school and how teachers are saying that um, <coughs> excuse me, you know, being black is, you know, inferior and whatever and mm -hmm. some of these students are from a biracial Yep. Marriage. Yep. So what do you do when you go home and you look at a white parent and a black parent? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But none of it's good. No. I mean, none of it's I mean, a person <coughs> who has those strong feelings or admits to will not necessarily always, typically will, you ask some of the racist Mm -hmm. So the fact if they um, but by doing this to some extent it may even dull their their conscience a little bit because they become justly justified with yeah. their actions are a little bit. They don't see their sin. They don't see their sin. Yep. And there's a danger not seeing your sin. Um, if you don't see your sin, then you don't see your need for Jesus. And that can be a dangerous thing. Okay. Second question. What can experiencing racism justifiably do to a person's thoughts and attitudes toward those who are racist towards them? I already talked about this. And if this happens enough times to enough people, what can happen to a community? And so we talked about the, the anger and the bitterness and the hatred that can build. Um, if that happens to enough particular people uh, of, a, of a particular community, what can be the result? Breaks down the community. Breaks down the community. Yeah. You know, that's where violence happens. And violence, yeah. 
Yeah, you, you start to form opinions as as a group of people that they do a paintbrush across everybody that 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 color is all bad. You know, uh, whether it's a, you know we've seen that some in some of these uh, meatpacking towns. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, there's a recent addition of Somalian um, and others is um, and, and yeah, you start stereotyping people and, and they feel like they're all being stereotyped when maybe they're even not. And so I mean, there's on both sides, it's a little bit Yeah, no, it's not, not good at all. I think Bill no. Thompson mm -hmm. said it best about 30 years ago. Don't condemn an entire race for the actions of a few. That's true. Yep. You know, as Alan was saying, same thing with the board of blush. You know, mm -hmm. not all white people are good, not all white people are bad. Yeah. Yeah, um, and to, to your comment, um, I can see comments. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if it's just an issue with the particular device. I am seeing other comments that people are leaving. Um, so if you are on the internet and you're trying to leave a comment, you can't. Just text me um, or send me a, a private message, um, and we'll I'll answer it that way. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So great discussion. Next question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It can take our eyes off of God. If we become so focused on our racial divisions and, our, and whatever else, then we're no longer seeing people as, as God's creation, and we're no longer then seeing God. Um, absolutely. All right, next question here. If you are in a pressure group and frustrated, angry, or resentful when the practice of critical race theory treats you unfairly because you're privileged, is it possible that you could give thanks to God for giving you the smallest taste of what racism does to a person. Absolutely. Right, so we, we talked about um, the, the, the oppression score. This was what we discussed last week, where how many, how many boxes do you have to see how oppressed you are? Um, and then we talked about the great reversal, where those who are oppressed rise up against their oppressors. Um, that's what this question is getting at. Um, if, we, if you have been treated based because of your privilege, you're a part of a privileged group, and that makes you angry. Um, can we rejoice in that? I think we can take an example of how Paul was treated at times in the Bible. And he talked a lot, he was in prison for mm -hmm. Christ. And uh, he, even though he was in the very worst of situations, he still found a way to rejoice. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. can if we look at some of the examples of those who have done it. Uh, most people will not do that naturally though. Right. Yeah. And that is that is a big challenge. And so uh, the point that the that the author here is making um, is that in our in our culture right now there is a lot of pushback against critical race theory and many such things, and, and rightfully so. Um, but part of that pushback is this, this sense of, uh, of um, what's the term? Reverse discrimination, uh, where it's, it's not okay that if you're in a, an oppressor group, and so we're talking about race, we'll say white, to complain about being discriminated against because you're an oppressor. And so there's this sense of frustration um, that you can't express you're being discriminated against because of what group you're assigned to. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And so what the author is saying is that if we've experienced that, uh, where because of your particular group and you can't express what you want to express, imagine then taking that and compounding it to uh, bring us empathy, to empathize and sympathize with those who have experienced much more prevalent racism their whole lives. Or discrimination. Or discrimination, or whatever it is. Um, and so this is a, yeah. So is it, it, he says here, is it possible this could help us be more empathetic towards those who have more regularly experienced racism? Um, and then he says, and then 
cause us to be more active in fighting against it. Um, and so then this is, a, this is part of what this Bible study is, 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 is getting at, is that we who, um, we are now getting, what's what I'm looking for? If we are now experiencing this for the first time and giving us this sense of empathy, this will encourage us to go out and to approach the issue of racism or other discrimination um, more fervently um, and, and speaking against it more fervently um, in, in a biblical way, not in the way of critical race theory and, and Marxism and overthrowing systems, but in a way of calling out with the law and then comforting with the gospel. Um, so seeing someone do something racist or discriminatory, whatever word you want to use, um, that we as Christians can speak up against that and say, you know what, that thing is wrong. Um, but then say, if, if repentance is there, but Jesus died for you, and, and offer that, that sense of forgiveness. Yeah. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that very specifically in a couple of weeks here. Okay, so the next question. If you have experienced racism, what role does God's gift of forgiveness found in Jesus take in the healing process? in a different way. Can you forgive those who discriminated against you? Yes. Yeah. I think just like any other sin, mm -hmm. the Bible, we're commanded to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Right. Um, we, as a Christian, we would recognize, we would hope to recognize someone does not know Jesus, it will maybe will be harder for them to accept that and do so, I would think. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not an easy thing to forgive somebody who's sinned against you. Uh, especially if you feel like the sin is egregious or if you don't know the person very well, it can be a challenge to, to offer that forgiveness. Um, but what's the alternative? What happens if we don't forgive? We we hold it inside and we, we may turn into a sin ourselves. I keep turning our back on but God. We, yeah, we're turning it back on God. We will uh, many, many times commit additional sins because of our anger and other feelings. Yeah. We have um, we basically harm ourselves because we're holding it in so much. Exactly, exactly. When we don't forgive others, um, that, that um, slight against us, Trespass, that's the word, the trespass against us. Um, we'll only breed more trespasses, more sins, build anger and bitterness and resentment, and we get into a spiral then of continuing this, this sinful bitterness. Um, and then forgiveness breaks the cycle. Um, it's a great tool that God, that God has given to us. Great. Next question. Do you agree with the following? Racism is an example of not loving people as souls who are uniquely created and redeemed in great love by God. Thus, the solution is simple. Love one another. God's love and forgiveness, given in his crucified son, takes what sin has torn apart and binds it back together again. As Christians, we possess the answer to the scourge of racism and of anti-racism. It's God's love given to us for the purpose of shining through us. Yeah, okay. Um, so then, you know, in, in summary here, loving one another and forgiving one another is the answer to racism. Uh, this love is based on the core teachings of Scripture. Each person is created in God's image and loved by God and Jesus. Each person is valuable and is to be respected and cared for. No matter how people identify themselves and one another, we must see each person as a dearly loved creation of God and redeemed by Jesus. Where there is racism, Christians must work to end it. That's the flag on the play. It takes more energy to hold resentment than to have forgiveness. I would say over time, um, that's true. Um, holding on to a grudge 
eventually gets to a point where it takes work, where you have to continue to, to hold on to it. But often in, in, the, in the immediacy, um, forgiveness can be the harder thing to do um, because of our, our, sinful, our sinfulness of, of um, wanting to react in kind. When somebody does something mean to us, our sinful nature wants to do something mean to them. Um, and that's, that's often the case. Uh, and so it can be a very, very challenging thing um, to immediately offer forgiveness, uh, but one that we pray that God helps us do. I always think of the example of the um, Sandy Hook elementary school shooting. Uh, if you remember that from a few years ago. Um, and where the, the community immediately offered forgiveness um, for the school shooting. I'm not sure that it, that would be easy to do um, for your first step to offer forgiveness. Um, even without an apology, to just, to just offer forgiveness. Um, the same could be said for John Paul. Um, sorry, Pope John Paul. You know, he forgave mm -hmm. the person that shot him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I imagine that's very, you know, very difficult to do, even though, yeah. you know, you're a clergy, you're a head of the church. It's yeah. He's treating the person as well. It is. It is. Um, and so we, we, in those moments, it's, it's good for us to look to, to the examples of Scripture. Um, I'm always drawn back to St. Stephen. Um, so St. Stephen was the first martyr. Um, so this is an early in the book of Acts, uh, and, and he's proclaiming the faith, and he's stoned to death. And the Apostle Paul, pre-Paul is there, so Saul is there, part of the, the stoning of Stephen, as it's called. And as he's dying, he offers forgiveness. Um, I imagine that also be a very challenging thing to do. Uh, and so, yeah, it is, it's, it's, it can be hard to forgive right away, um, but it's a very important thing to do um, because it's ultimately for your benefit and for their benefit. Um, yeah, okay, great. Thank you for your thoughts. Something else I was going to say. Lost it. All right, well, let's go on then. So now we're going to talk about anti racism um, and the difference between racism and anti racism. So there's, there's two words that we're going to be using a lot woke and anti racist. Anti-racist has also become DEI, which is what it's called most in our culture right now, um, which stands for diversity. Organizations that do DEI training, um, diversity, equity, and inclusivity training, um, and that's all part of the anti-racist umbrella. And we'll talk about that now. Okay, um, so we learned in the previous section that it goes largely unrealized today um, that much of current social racial tension is caused by the use of two different definitions of racism. One definition of racism is consistent with the scriptures. The other definition comes from cultural Marxism and from critical race theory. And this speaks of systemic racism. So systemic racism and racism are different things. Um, and we'll talk about that now. So Mary Webster's def definition of racism has been changed. Um, and it's now this. The systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another group. And a political or social system founded on racism and designed to execute its principles. That's the current definition of racism, according to Merriam-Webster. And as a reminder, um, here is the previous definition. 
a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Notice the differences here. Um, the new definition is about systems. Um, while a system can contain racist elements that are evil, um, we will discuss the implications for a society when you label an entire system racist and you blame systems for all of societal woes. So as an anti-racist is currently defined, you can have relatives in an oppressed group, love them with your whole heart, and still consider them to be racists. I'm going to talk about that now. Um, there's a video, um, it's called Critical Theory is Systemically Brainwashing Us. It was too long of a video to show um, in class today. But in the video, um, it's, it's clearly stated that according to cultural Marxism and critical race theory, racism is not your um, opinion of people of another race, but rather it's a system of oppression. Right. And so the old definition of racism was What's your opinion of somebody with a different color of skin? That was the old definition. The new definition is um, what system of oppression are they part of? Racism <coughs> has changed. No, the definition of racism has changed. So you can have an opinion of racism, but in current definition, if you don't have a process to do that, you're not truly be racist because you're not showing it, displaying it openly. So the new definition of racism, um, it's not about individuals. Um, and so there can be, um, so it's, an action. It's, an about, it's about systems or groups. And, and so the, the words that we hear the most are systemic. It's systemic racism. The problem's not in the people. It's the way that the structure of the system has been built. So if and so our bank doesn't take steps to ensure that all races have equal access to credit in some aspect, it isn't a, uh, a racist type thing because that system was flawed. Yeah, I think so. Um, another. Another example would be that at some car dealerships, um, women pay on average 10% more for a car than men. Um, there's nobody intentionally going out there trying to swindle widows. Um, that's just the system. Right? There's this, this, I'm making something up. No, that's, that would be it. So it's not the individual salesman who's at fault. It's the way that selling cars is orchestrated. That's at fault. Um, the right. system of car sales is in itself oppressive, and so we should have a new system for selling cars. Um, or the example, the system of banking is oppressive, so we need a new way to bank, right. or to do away with banking altogether. We're measured on that all the time. You know, what interest rate we have for different uh, yeah. races, uh, a certain gender, and they'll look at what the averages are, and they'll say, okay, you know, we... And then we just throw away everything that's ever applied. Right, and so that's that's the thing. But so they're trying to measure it now to return, they're trying to, they're more of a measurement, they're trying to prove whether or not you're doing it rather than, you know, stick to the, the they want to be very objective versus very subjective. Yeah, and so, and, and the new definition of racism is it's not talking about individuals, it's talking about groups. And so it, it wouldn't even be an individual bank. It would be banking. The system, the financial system is oppressive. And so we need to have a new financial system. Um, so let's do away with all banks, do away with capitalism, and bring in something else. That would be the systemic oppression. Which is even, it's even wider. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to the old way, which would be there is an individual who is discriminating against somebody solely based on the color of their skin. That, that's, the, that's, that's the new thing. So um, in, this, in this new definition of racism, uh, the systemic one, it's, it's, it's Marxist. And there's no way for an individual to shed the label of racist. 
So no matter how hard you try to say, I'm not a racist person, I don't think racistly, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it's not about your personal behavior, not about your personal actions. Um, it's about you being part of a system. And so in, in, in systemic oppression, being white automatically makes you a racist because whites are oppressors. Regardless of if you've had any um, racist actions in, in your life at all, simply because you're part of that group, you're racist. And no amount of denying that will change it. The best that you can do is become woke. Um, the alternative. Yep. Woke um, comes from that you, you have waken up. Or you are awake. How do you want to say it? Um, to the fact that you're an oppressor. And so if I'm woke, that means I know that I'm an oppressor. And so it would be things like, I'm speaking from a place of privilege, somebody will say, something like that. Recognizing your status as being a part of an oppressive group. That's, that's not entirely a terrible position to be speaking if you're recognizing that we all have a certain level of racism and everything with even if we try very hard not to. Um, because we are we do we have been granted some privileges without earning them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we should use them improperly. So Right. Um this part that part isn't so bad that speaking from the part you approach it that way. Yeah, and that, that would be a very healthy and a very a very biblical and Christian way to do it will be to look at my own, my own sinful thoughts, words, and deeds, and to repent of them. Um, but what this is doing is, is this is talking in bigger groups. Because I fit into this particular demographic or this particular uh, box of qualities, I am assigned these attributes, whether I have these attributes or not. Um, and so this is, it's not individuals, this is systems, um, is what this is, what this is. It takes away the moral responsibility of individuals, or it assigns moral sins to individuals based on which system they're, they're part of. So we're not thinking in terms of individuals, we're thinking in terms of, of, of systems. But what you're saying is exactly right and healthy, and that's where we're going, and that's where we want to get to. Uh, are you saying that there could be two ways? I mean, people that are in that privileged system or group, mm -hmm may themselves be relished in that they were one of the helmet ones. Yeah. Or if you weren't in that group, you may say in the group, we are going to be mad at you because you're one of the, what you call it. Yeah. The, the helmet ones of the group. Yep. So the example that we talked about a few chapters ago um, was on an abortion. Uh, me as a, as a man, am I allowed to have an opinion on abortion? According to the anti-racist woke kind of philosophy, no. Because as a man, I am part of an oppressor group, and my moral opinion isn't valid. Um, whereas if I was a woman, I would have be able to speak on that issue more. Um, not because of anything that I've ever done, but it's simply because of this group that I'm in, I'm a boy, I can't have an opinion about something else. Um, and so on other issues that gets applied to two, um, on the issue of racism, I as a person who is, is white cannot have an opinion about racism because I am part of the oppressor group. Um, regardless of how I, my thoughts and my actions and my participation in it, just simply because of my skin color, I can't, I'm not allowed to do that. Whereas somebody who is as a different skin color, their opinion on how racism should be tackled is much more authoritative than mine would be. Can I ask a very blunt question? Yes. Who thought this crap up? Karl Marx. <laughs> so yeah. All of this. So this, this is this is this is all built on 
um, what we've been talking about, the, the way to usher in a Marxist utopia, right? So Karl Marx had the idea of utopia. So there is the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the oppressors and oppressed. Uh, the proletariat would rise up, overthrow bourgeoisie, redistribute everything, everybody would be happy. Never worked. His, a follower of his was an Italian, his last name was Gramsci, Gramsci, I don't know how to say it in Italian. Uh, he was like, why didn't it work? And so he developed this idea that there are things that hold society together. If Marxism needs to split society to make everything a level playing field, then it has to be against the things that hold society together. And so he started the School of Thought, and that School of Thought um, became the Frankfurt School, and then moved to the United States in World War II. And they developed tools to destroy systems. And those tools were called, one of them is called critical theory. Um, and there are lots of critical theories. There's critical economic theory. Um, just as another example, critical race theory is one. The purpose of critical theory is to complain about something enough that people start to hate it. Um, and in order to tear everything down, divide people to tear it down. And so critical race theory is intentional in trying to divide people, to get them to fight against each other, to tear down the systems. There are five main systems. Um, there's schools, universities, churches, media, and government. There are the five systems. Institutions is another word. And so it seeks to get into the institutions to tear them down. And we can see critical race theory, uh, wokeism is what it's sometimes called now, in these things, working to divide people, to tear down systems, um, to, to, bring about, to bring about these changes. Dr. Lentz, you spoke about that a couple weeks ago, but yep. I was just wondering where does the utopia come in because it doesn't seem like there is any. Yeah, so the utopia is in, once everything is torn down, you can rebuild and give everybody everything equal, and everybody's going to be happy. That's how that works. That's how that works. <laughs> once, once everybody has all their needs met, <coughs> once everybody is, is full, is warm, is clothed, has a house, once all those you know basic needs are met, everybody will be happy. We talked about how that doesn't work biblically, right? Marxism does not account for sin. And if people work in the day of Karl Marx, so who thought that it was going to be a good idea in 2022. And, and so the understanding of Marxism is that it's never been done properly. <laughs> and so we got to try to get and do it right. <coughs> um, and we'll talk specifically um, about... Is that the definition of insanity? So like, um, we're not talking about Black Lives Matter today, but Black Lives Matter is expressly Marxist, and they talk about how they want to take down those individual systems to take down the church, to take down families, to take down education, and so on and so on and so on, and break those things down because they're oppressive systems. And we'll take a look at that more, more next week. Uh, flag on the play. Is Pope Francis woke? I don't know. I think so. I don't think woke is the, the correct word to describe the Pope. Um, the Pope does, and I'm not Catholic, so I'm not a huge authority on what the Pope does. Uh, I only hear about him when he does things that are silly. Um, the Pope is, is if in my, my understanding, le a more leaning towards a, a social gospel. Um, social gospel is where the purpose of Christianity is to address social issues in society. Um, this is the, the talking of um, like the ELCA here in the United States would be another group that does this. Um, we're one of the most, the most challenging issues facing the world today. Pope Francis doesn't usually talk about sinfulness. He talks about society problems, um, which are important things to talk about. Uh, but I don't think he's doing it in, in, in a woke way. Um, and so while he's not acting in the way that traditional um, popes have, I wouldn't go as far as to say that he's woke. At least in my understanding. I haven't, I haven't done a pope watch in a long time. Um, but yeah. Okay.
Let's continue. Page 49. So then, somebody who's anti-racist is somebody who actively fights against systems of oppression. So if you don't actively fight against it, you're still racist. Even if you believe that everyone is equal, everybody's equal in value, everybody's equally worthy of love, everyone's equally created in God's image. In fact, you can have relatives in an oppressed group, love them with your whole heart, and still be racist by definition. This would speak to that thing you talked about, about the blended family, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, half of the family is an oppressor, the other half is oppressed, even though they're happily married. Um, by this definition. By this definition, yeah. yeah. Then in contrast to that, um, uh, a, a member of a, of a minority group is not capable of being considered a racist. By definition, by this new definition. Even though they show many of those characteristics individually. In, in, the group. In, yep, even though they exhibit the old definition of racism, the new definition, they're not racist. Because it's not about what an individual person believes. It's about their oppressed group identity. So it's not about people, it's about systems. So those that are in that group, is that something that is included individually or has been discussed so much that they started to believe that or they naturally lean towards that anyway? Yeah, it's... That's what I'm looking for. It's, it's hard to say because it's become the expectation that that's how you would behave. That if you're part of the oppressed group, you have to act in a way um, that we would classically consider to be racist to break the systems of oppression. Um, so Ibram Kendi, we talked about him earlier, he said, the only solution to past discrimination is present discrimination. And the only dis solution to present discrimination is future discrimination. Uh, where you actively have to discriminate, you know, be racist, in order to solve the problems of racism. Um, it does seem to, it's a lot of fictional thinking to me. It is, it is, absolutely it is. And that's part of it, that's part of that, that, that dividing, of the, the separating the proletariat, proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Um, that when you're put into that I'm an oppressed group, it intentionally instills in you a sense of, of, of victimhood. Um, and entitlement. Yes. Okay, so here's an example of it. This is a true story from 2021. Um, this is the, the new definition of, of racism, or the anti-racist racism. Um, in May of 2021, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who is Chicago's first black female mayor, declared that she would only be interviewed by people, by reporters of color. I'm not sure if you remember this story. I don't remember that very well. Yep. Um, her reasoning was that, quote, the overwhelming maleness and whiteness, end quote, of the press corps did not reflect the population of Chicago. She further indicated that, quote, the Chicago media leadership must evolve with the times in order to be a true reflection of the vibrant, vast diversity of our city, end quote. Denying a group of people access to oneself based solely on the color of their skin is traditionally defined as racist. Right? But according to the new definition of racism, which is based solely on your opposition status, I'm sorry, your oppression status, uh, members of an oppressed group cannot be racist. As such, the mayor's actions, while they were criticized by some, they were ultimately allowed. Her actions were motivated by the Marxist goal of equity, which unfairly tears some people down. Right. So something that is overtly racist, you can't speak to me if you're white, um, was allowed because of the new definition of racism, where it's not about individual people, it's about systems. And so the oppressors were discarded, the oppressed were allowed 
to do whatever they wanted, essentially, to have to step in and, and fill this up. Okay. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream based on the scriptural understanding of racism, the traditional understanding, that people would not be judged based upon the color of their skin, but on the, quote, content of their character. In contrast, culture Marxism, a new racism, um, judges people based on their group identity, and thus judges people based upon, among other things, the color of their skin. The Marxist definition of racism, new racism, contradicts Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. Right, and so Martin Luther and his King Jr. in his famous speech wanted um, racism to be such a thing of the past that people didn't see race at all. They were judged based solely on who they were, not what they looked like. Whereas in the new definition, it's based solely on what you look like, not who you are. Yeah, Martin Luther told us in years ago, we were just about that um, as far as not seeing the color of a person's skin. Um, and then all of a sudden things just did a 180. Mm -hmm. There has been a, a strong a strong move back. Yeah. Okay. So in a C CNN news article posted on their website from June 12th of 2020, um, Kennedy Mitchum, who at that time was 22 year old, um, was a student at Drake University she was featured as having sent emails to Merriam-Webster to change the definition of racism to include systemic racism. She was upset that some of her classmates did not share her woke understanding of racism and they were using the dictionary against her arguments. Editor-in-chief Alex Chambers of the dictionary replied to her by saying, the revision will not have been made without your persistence in contacting us about this problem. We sincerely thank you for repeatedly writing in and apologizing and apologize to you for the harm and offense we have caused in failing to address this issue sooner. So as stated earlier, the first definition of racism is this, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and characteristics, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. That was changed and forego of this, the systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another, and a political or system, social system founded upon racism designed to execute its principles. So the definition has changed from individuals to systems. So with this new definition of racism, anyone who is not an anti-racist is a racist. If you are not actively working to take down an oppressive system, you are racist. But if racism is a sin of thought, word, and deed, born of lovelessness toward those whom God created and loves, then the solution is to repent. It's to see others as God does and to love them, respect them, and cherish them accordingly. However, if racism is a system of oppression, then the answer is to tear the system down and rebuild it, which is the goal of Marxism. So as we study the new racism, another great divide between Christianity and culture Marxism is revealed. Christians derive truth and values from scripture, that is, God's word. Culture Marxists believe good and bad, right and wrong, can be determined by the color of your skin. The two definitions of racism are completely at odds with one another. Last question for tonight. You don't have to answer it, just things to think about. Have you personally ever been called a racist without actually having any racist malice in your heart? Have you seen events or objects called racism that you don't understand are racist at all? Remember again the Ohio State professor who was labeled racist for saying that college football could bring a healthy unity to a divided world. Does this new definition of racism help understand why those judgments occur? And what was the standard by which you were judged? Right. Final thought for the day. I can't say yeah. that I have specifically been called a racist. I heard a story of a parent that took a child to uh, 
uh, college last year, mm -hmm. and during the orientation, your first question was, um, we want you to first ponder your, your wakefulness, basically, yeah. it was, and what that does to people. Yeah. As we basically terminated that fresh, incoming freshman, the family, the mother heard about it, was there. But that was intentionally terminated right off the bat as an opening comment for this. Yeah. I thought that was really that's, impressive. That's a very key factor of DEI training, um, is to, to sit and ponder how your race affects how you interact with people. Um, I know this from conversations that this is part of us part of school district training um, of teachers, when these teachers have in-service days and they have to go through seminars to talk about things. Sometimes they are DEI training. And one particular teacher was recounting how the first thing they had to do was ponder their whiteness for 60 minutes and how that impacts how they teach in the classroom. Um, so how does your race impact how you teach? And to some extent, and to some extent, thinking about awareness is not all bad, but when it's positioned in such a way as to be yeah. discriminatory, uh, that's going a little bit further right. than normal. Anyway. Right. So, it, uh, as it says here, right, when we, when, we, when we see it as our own sinfulness, right, that I, you know, maybe I have done something wrong and I should repent of that and, and work to mend it, that's appropriate. That's what God wants us to do. That's the biblical understanding of it. Um, and, and but when it's seen as an individual, not as a person that happens to be white. Right. And when it seems as you're just part of this group and you're not actively fighting it, you're not fighting your, your group identity um, to tear down the systems, you're racist. You're two uh, very separate things. Um, but what you're saying is true and it's healthy and it's good. And we're going to keep talking about that. That's that's where that's where this Bible study is building. Um, yeah, spoilers: the solutions that the church has to offer in this discussion is one of individual responsibility. I messed up. Um, repentance. I'm sorry. How can I do better? Yeah, it just seems like we're it's good to recognize that this is the way it is, mm -hmm. but don't be bitter about that part. That doesn't mean accepting necessarily going into the logic to the extent that they're asking you to. Yeah. But to instead focus on others the way God wants us to. Yeah. And uh, by that, hope that others will follow suit and that this whole movement will won't go away, but it'll diminish a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a chance for us to, uh, to encourage everyone, those inside the church and those outside the church, to see each individual person has intrinsic value because they're human. Simply because you're a human, you have equal value that I have because I'm a human. Because all of us are created in God's image, redeemed by Christ alone, have salvation in Christ alone. Um, and so each individual person is just like me in that sense. What's exciting is we've always just from the childhood, the pastors we have in our church have always encouraged that, and mm -hmm. the church body, for the most part, has always encouraged that, although we're all sinful, so you can't mm -hmm. say it but perfectly. But we have been doing this, but it hasn't been because we're trying to fight woke or anti-racism or anything, because it was just the right thing to do. Right. Right. And so, part of what we're building to is then, you know, how did this come up? Right. Why is this the prevalent way of talking about racism in the United States right now? If the church has a solution to it, why is this one being talked about, not the church's solution to it? And then what can we as the church, collectively as Christians, systems, and as individual Christians, how can we fight this teaching, which is anti-Christian in every fiber of it, um, to it is, proclaim the gospel of Christ. It is tough because some of the institutions you talked about, the media and some of it, they've been maybe much stronger inroads into that already. Yeah. 
show that that strong institutions upon teaching, creating a culture, especially the young, the youth, is the, yeah. you want to change the nation, you start with the young and work and then it carries through. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so the, the, the study here, as it's called, is it called Courage, Confession, and Love? Um, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. Um, how, we, how do we have courage to talk about it? What do we confess? And how do we do it lovingly? Um, which are the, the last three lessons, which we'll talk about in two weeks. Um, specifically, specifically through this. I have to admit, though, it's kind of hard not to be angry about what's happening in the country today. Um, yeah, it certainly is. Um, sinful things, it's, it's, uh, it's always hard to not be angry at sinful things. Um, but then how do you respond to your anger will be the, the important question. Um, what do you do? Something to think about. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to think about it. Um, <laughs> what do you do? Right? Um, we talked about the, the, the danger of anger already. Um, oh. And so how do we work through it? Again, I have an answer. I'm just yeah. not giving it to you today. Something to think about. Patience and love. Those are good things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does happen, right? People do accuse others of, of privilege. One of the comments is I've been accused of privilege many times. I've been accused of privilege before. Uh, and it, it does, it does happen. Um, and it's it's good. It's it's helpful to see where it comes from, uh, and then we'll talk about how do we respond to it later. I want you to think about it. It's it's, it's good for us as thoughtful Christians to ponder these things um, and, and search the scriptures and see what we can come up with, which is what your homework is, or you just keep coming back to Bible study and I'll tell you in a couple weeks. Ha ha ha. All right. Any last thoughts, questions, or concerns? Okay. Um, then we'll share the final thought here, um, and then we'll close with prayer. So the final thought. Although it's been stated before, I'm going to state it again. If racism is a sin of thought, word, and deed, born of lovelessness towards those whom God creates and loves, the solution is to repent and to see others as God sees them. If racism, on the other hand, is a system of oppression, the answer then is to tear down that system and to rebuild it. In the word of God, God has made it very clear what racism is and is not. God, not the color of your skin, determines truth. Let us repent of racism um, as God defines it, and not let false accusations ruin a good conscience or ruin peace given by God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, help us to hold to your truth and not let any false teachings lead us away from you. Instead, ever draw us closer to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Internet, for being here. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week.